Firewatch starts out with a silent menu screen. It's not really completely silent, you can hear the sounds of wind and the like in the background, but it's missing the grand eyes announcements that you often see in games. Instead, you double click the icon, a black screen comes up, and it fades into a serene image of a lookout tower in the wind. There's no complex animation, no crescendo in the music as the title fades into view. It's all oddly humble. Almost like it's a question. Firewatch? Because that's what the game is, an offer, an invitation. You're just like Henry, really, looking to escape his life and enter a place where his position is undetermined, looking for a break where he's unknown and can reflect and introspect, where he can do something new where his future is not at stake. Henry doesn't accept the fire lookout position because he's particularly passionate about stopping forest fires, or because he wants a career in the forest service, or because he's been seduced by their incredible mascot. Ah. I don't think there's any fictional character I hate more than Forrest Burns. Henry, as an employee of the Forest Service, that is treason. He leaves his life in Boulder after his wife Julia develops early onset dementia and is sent away for care, throwing his life into shambles and leaving him aimless and depressed. Henry, though maybe not consciously, is hoping to put his life on pause, to allow him to distance himself from his life and reflect on it from an outside perspective, maybe to confront the fact that his connections to his established life are mainly arbitrary, that he can define himself differently. The job ad in the paper offers him exactly this, working as a fire lookout is exactly what he needs. It's 1989, the job still involves sitting in a tower surrounded by millions of acres of uninhabited forest, with little beside his own thoughts for company. It's perfect, really. And that's oddly poetic, right? Because fundamentally speaking, that's more or less exactly why you play video games. Or if not that, it's at least one of the main reasons why people play and enjoy video games. There's a camaraderie there between Henry and the person controlling him, and the game seems to really encourage it. In any other game, I would feel entirely uninvested in the main character given the game's short three hour runtime, much less during the beginning. But any new save has you watching Henry grow up. He goes from hitting on a woman he meets at a bar as a drunken college student to marrying her and becoming a real adult as you direct his choices based on textual representations of his life. It's an ideal way of starting a game like this, the somber and reflective music combined with the player quickly making decisions as Henry as they imagine his life flashing in front of them in a few minutes means that the player externalizes themselves into Henry. Henry is the player. His own life doesn't really matter, it's a stand-in for the players, communicated by the player's ability to make both big and small decisions in his life, both goal-setting and emotional outbursts. Henry quickly becomes the player. His escape from life becomes the player's escape from life. The time he spends deep into the Shoshone National Forest is similarly used by the player to let themselves reflect on their own lives, to introspect, taking advantage of the oddly spiritual and profound properties inherent to nature. At least, that's how I interpreted it. When I first played this game in late 2017, it really served that purpose for me. The dose of beautiful scenery and photogenic vistas are the next best thing to the real thing, and the game taking place in the late 80s removes another obstacle to reflection, electronics. Altogether, the scene is... introspective. You know, we'll try to have some fun this summer. I promise. But Firewatch really does not stand up to any real technical analysis. Its gameplay is non-existent, since it's essentially a map reading simulator. The actual complex portions of the story really don't make a lot of sense when properly analyzed, and while the moment to moment writing of the characters is genuinely some of the best writing I've ever seen in the game, truly characterizing believable and sympathetic people in a relatively small game, the actual high level story direction is pretty bad and incoherent. On top of all of this, the game has horrendous performance issues. I'm a reasonably capable guy when it comes to computers and the like, but I couldn't find any way to fix the problem of my frame rates crashing through the floor whenever I look at something that is interactable. But it really doesn't matter, because this is precisely the kind of game where overanalyzing the content is missing the point. Because this is a game that goes all in on a single theme, escapism. For the character in the story, and for you, the player. This game's goal is to act as a pause, to let everyone catch their breath before they plunge headfirst back into their lives. I think that if any of this has caught your interest at all, you should try the game. 
It's quite short, and in my experience, subsequent playthroughs aren't really necessary. I'm keenly aware of the fact that I'm recommending everything I play on this channel. These videos have started taking so long that I think I'm subconsciously picking games that I wouldn't mind spending a ton of time with. But if you think you tend to agree with my taste in games, I think you'll enjoy this one. Maybe wait for a sale. $22 for a 3 hour game isn't really good value, but it's quite a meaningful experience and I'm not alone in that assessment. From now on, I'll be discussing specific story events and talking about every part of the game, so the spoiler warning goes into effect. What do you know? People with shitty manners drink shitty beer. What, you don't like a cold light on a hot day? No, no, I do. But then again, I didn't say my manners were any good. Better than these fucking litter bugs, though, that's for sure. Firewatch starts out as a text adventure game. Henry is a drunken 20-something at a bar in Boulder, Colorado when he sees a cute girl spending the night with her fellow graduates and professors. He pathetically tries to hit on Julia, and somehow it works, and they end up together. You continue to make decisions in Henry's life, big and small. They adopt a dog, Julia gets a job offer from Yale, you get in a fight at midnight, you get mugged at a festival. Then, slowly, Julia begins having problems at work. She begins forgetting important things and has to be sent home on permanent medical leave. She has early onset dementia. Henry has to make the decision of how to take care of her. You might choose to send her away in a care home. You might choose to send her back to Australia to live with her family. Either way, Henry's life spirals out of control. No matter your choices, Henry will see an ad for a job in the paper, a summer as a fire watch, and he decides to take it. Interspaced in these panels are short walking segments that documents Henry's trek to the fire tower. He leaves Boulder in his truck and must hike to his sector over the course of a whole day. It's somewhat difficult for me to praise this opening. On the one hand, it's cheating. A very common problem that exists in narratives of any kind is an overassumption of the audience's attachment to a character. I usually just don't care when the authors kill off characters in the first chapter. I barely know who they were. I don't care that Vladimir dies a brutal death in Battlefield 3. The extent of my interaction with him was a two minute car ride. It feels cheap and artificial when writers try to pull off something like this in a game. But it's even worse when they try to force you to be emotionally attached to their characters by using a long backstory or some kind of sympathetic attribute. Well, the start to this game is really the same thing, forcing a backstory onto Henry over emotionally charged music. It's cheating. Music is a really powerful emotional tool and the writers are basically just abusing it to imbue their character with sympathy that he doesn't deserve. Then they went ahead and gave him an ill wife and for the love, I barely know anything about this character and I'm already rooting for him. But it's not so simple here. First of all, I'm doing the deciding. I'm deciding which dog Henry gets, and I'm deciding how he treats his wife after she comes home late. I'm deciding where to send her, and I'm deciding to beat the mugger to a pulp. Shifting the responsibility here is still kind of cheating, but at least it's more genuine. I do genuinely feel more attached to Henry after living his life. It's not just the devs ticking a box that says, add emotional moment. More importantly though, and this is something that will be a constant theme throughout the game, the sheer quality of the writing here absolutely carries so many other shortcomings here. The decisions that you make are dictated by emotions that you don't control. When Julia comes home late, you can't decide to not be angry. You merely pick between two pathetic and futile reactions. You get mad or you ignore her. It's pointless, and you know that as a player. Hell, if something like this happened to me in real life, I'd probably know that my reaction is futile as well. But I don't know if I'd have the self-discipline to just swallow my pride and shut my mouth. It's brilliant writing. There's subtext to consciously selecting either of these options. It conveys emotionality and tone with quite literally nothing, really. It's storytelling with a button. I can't praise this use enough. Julia gets a job offer from Yale, and again, you don't get to decide how Henry emotionally reacts to this. He doesn't want to move. Your options are both pretty bad, all things considered, and in the end they change nothing. When you get mugged at that festival, you don't decide how Henry reacts emotionally. If you beat the thief to a pulp, Henry still collapses and weeps until the cops arrive, and like, yeah. I I think that's exactly how I would react. I suppose it's possible that whoever wrote Henry coincidentally envisioned him 
particularly similar to me, definitely not in every way, but at least in emotionality. I have no way of knowing to what extent this is true. I can't know how much of this relatability is just because I'm similar to Henry, or how much of it is because Henry is similar to humans in general. And that's probably an unfalsifiable question anyway. I don't know how to conclude my point here. We can't know the answer to this question. If you've played this game, or if you decide to play it, let me know if you feel the same way, I suppose. Okay, so the writers cheat, but it doesn't really matter because the game never takes advantage of it. There isn't really a loser here, except this guy I guess, and if it makes the game more impactful then so be it, as long as that reaction is genuine. And I really think that it is, after all there has to be a point where exploitation of human emotions goes from being a cheap trick to being a legitimate writing technique. The trickery continues when the game starts in earnest. As you climb into Two Forks Watchtower, a fire lookout from Thorofair contacts you by radio, Delilah, your only companion for your summer-long stay at the Shoshone National Forest. The great writing continues. The wit and humor displayed by both characters is great and makes them both very likable immediately. From the first moment, the two protagonists have great chemistry together. You later find out that Delilah is a little drunk here, maybe that's why she's so friendly and straightforward, but it sure goes a long way towards getting you invested in both characters right away. Henry sleeps in on his first day, knocked out by the two day hike to Two Forks Tower, and by the time he wakes up, it's already midday. As Delilah talks him through the procedures and equipment, they are interrupted by fireworks in the middle of the forest in the middle of fire season. The source seems to be Jonesy Lake in Henry Sector, and so Delilah sends him to investigate. When this game came out in 2016, it was one of the first mainstream successes of a kind of new genre that's now deridedly referred to as walking simulators. I never played the older examples, the originals, Dear Esther, The Vanishing of Ethan Carter, and the like. Instead, Firewatch was my entry into that field, followed by What Remains of Edith Finch, a phenomenal game, Gone Home, an okay game, and then later on, Drogon, a really interesting game that deserves its own video. And these games really do live up to their genre. You walk around interact with objects, listen to dialogue, and walk around some more. So these games are rightly critiqued for having no gameplay, being pointless, being boring. And yeah, they're kind of right. These titles are boring as games, but that's missing the point, right? These titles are not really games, they're listed on Steam, sure, but they're closer to the art side of things. Gaming as a medium is evolving and maturing, I think. It's only expected that as it becomes more and more a main part of culture in general, the more it distances itself from being a toy for children and being entertainment, then it will not only move towards more mature topics, but also into the experimental and abstracted realms. I don't think that it's correct or even fair to judge these games as we do other games. I think that it is the case that these walking simulators don't have mechanics, strictly speaking. Which is to say that they're not even really walking simulators, they're not actually simulating walking. The prime primary action taking place isn't walking. If you're reading a novel, what you're doing isn't reading per se, the text itself is central to the experience of what you are doing. If the text was replaced with an IQ manual, you wouldn't be having the same experience. The context of the walking is important in these walking simulator games. What's happening around you is important. What the story is, is important. You don't play these games for a great gameplay experience. If all you play are walking simulators, you're not gaming, strictly speaking. Maybe Firewatch and games like it have more in common with books actually. Walking Simulator is not a good descriptor for them, they're more narrative games maybe. The narrative here is the emphasis of the experience, its expression was the primary goal of the developer. Recently, the game part of these narrative games has also become more explored, with Death Stranding being the main example of that in my opinion. So yeah, Firewatch is a narrative walking simulator. You walk, and you talk, Guess what? and in your first few playthroughs you look at the map, but again, this really fits the game. Despite what it looks like at first, you quickly begin to learn the map and can navigate Henry's sector pretty quickly. If your expectations are in order, the game doesn't let you get bored, with Delilah constantly on the radio with you. So many items are interactable and examinable, and many of these items also have dialogue that you can explore. The game is really just about talking, about specific things, and about general things. So anyway, you make your way towards Jonesy Lake, fall off a cliff, no, no, no! miraculously don't break anything, find a campfire with fireworks to match. Uh oh, uh, Delilah? It's two young women. And they're naked. Can you handle that? Come on, I like naked ladies, same as anyone, but there's, you know. Two? Yeah. Turn the corner and there they are, in the distance, lighting fireworks. They think you're peeking them and call you a pervert, and you can steal their speakers. Delilah even comments on this. Oh, wow. Um, 
music's a little loud. This is the first of a few times where you see another person in this game. The next happens right after. As you climb out of a cave you went through to get back to your tower, when you see someone shine a light at you and quickly turn and run. You tell Delilah about this and she isn't really surprised. She says that it's a national forest and people come and go. Both of these times, they are just black outlines of the distance. And I think that while it was probably initially a choice made due to budget and practical reasons, it ends up actually being a positive for the game. The themes I discussed at the beginning of a mental break and introspection are supported by physical loneliness, and portraying these other characters in this way distances them from you and Henry, reinforcing that feeling. The other times that you meet people, well, they don't really count, for obvious reasons that will become apparent when we get to those parts of the game. Henry hikes back towards Two Forks, heading through a small cave. He finds a section that has been fenced off, and finds out that it was Cave 452. Delilah says that the key was lost a while ago. Henry seems curious, but does not press the issue, and continues towards Two Forks. As he approaches the stairs, he finds that his typewriter has been taken out of his room and is thrown. He quickly runs up to find that his tower has been broken into, in the middle of the Shoshone forest, far from civilization. Someone broke in. They what? They just, they wrecked the place, threw my typewriter out the window. Motherfucker! Holy shit. Um, I'll let the forest service know what happened. Henry wakes up to a distressed Delilah, who's just lost contact with the Forest Service. She tells Henry that her only method of communicating with them is through a wire that winds through the Shoshone. Henry offers to check the wire for damage, and sets off for the day. On his way to, his conversation with Delilah is interrupted as she talks to someone else through her radio. Hey, can you hold on a sec? Uh, sure. Just gonna keep hiking and hoping it warms up. Heyo. I don't think so. Why, have you? Okay, good. No, I don't think he has any idea. I'm absolutely sure. Would you? All right. I'll let you know if anything changes in that regard. Yeah. This really sounds like she's talking about Henry, and it's meant to be suspicious. If you ask her about it, she gets kind of passive-aggressive. This call is kind of important, keep it in mind for later on, but we can gloss over it for now. Henry hikes until he finds the wire poles and follows them, optionally stopping along the way to get a hat, and explore an old firewatch cabin. Ironically, this cabin has been burnt to a crisp. At the pinnacle of Beartooth Peak, Henry finds that the wire has been intentionally cut. Delilah suggests that it was the teens from Jonesy Lake, and sends Henry to scare them away. A column of smoke is soon spotted that Delilah theorizes is a campfire, and so Henry heads towards it. On the way, he finds an old frozen backpack stuck on a tree. Taking it down, you finally get some rope that won't snap on you, and a camera with plenty of film left. The name tag on the hiking back says that it once belonged to a Brian Goodwin. Delilah is very surprised to hear that, and fills Henry in on the history of his sector. Two Forks Tower is not a new tower. Before Henry, there was at least one other firewatch, Ned Goodwin. Ned was a pretty gruff and mean guy, strict and quiet, an army veteran with PTSD who, like Henry, was looking to escape from his life. But he couldn't, not completely. He had a son that he brought with him, Brian. Brian was really the opposite of his dad. He was, by all accounts, a total nerd in the classic sense. He loved the tabletop RPG Wizards and Wyverns and fantasy novels. You can find a map that he made of Henry Sector in Two Orcs Tower, filled with fantasy themed names and make believe. He brought his Game Boy with him. Yeah? I like Pong. Everybody likes Pong. And built electronics with his dad, who seemed to know a lot about them. Brian wasn't supposed to be at Two Forks. The Forest Service would not allow it. But he had nowhere to go after Ned accepted the job. Delilah, not being a stickler for rules, says that she covered for them, making up lies to the Forest Service and concealing Brian's presence. Until one day, they both disappeared. Delilah says that this happens a lot. Lookouts arrive at the Shoshone and realize that they just can't deal with the intense loneliness and boredom, and end up escaping, hiking back, and leaving without notifying anyone. Henry's hike takes them through the valley and into a lush forest, finally into a clearing. If the player has any sense, Henry stops here to take some photos and finds a teen's campsite just behind some rocks. Their camp has been torn up, their magazines are all over the floor. I have entered the teen zone. And their tents are torn up with their clothes tattered. They left a note for Henry. They think he did it. As far as I can tell, they returned from a trip or something and found their camp in the state. And they think that the guy at the lake was also the person responsible for destroying the camp. They write that they're going to call the police, but Henry is relieved to find that they have actually left the forest for good. Threatening to call the police because they think I attacked them. Oh my god, well, did you? 
Don't be ridiculous. It's not ridiculous. I've known you, what, 24 hours? Maybe, maybe you're nuts. God, look, I just came out here to sit in a tower, all right? Not get into some mess with a bunch of co-eds. It's fine. They're, they're gone? Yeah, they're gone. But you should see this place. It's just, it's weird. Day 3 starts with Henry boarding up the Vandal's handiwork on his window. As he does this, Delilah asks him about his appearance, telling him that she's drawing him. You answer a few questions here, and it acts primarily as character building. Based on your answers here, you can find a drawing of Henry and Delilah's tower at the end of the game. The banter between the two is still phenomenally written, and this is time taken purely for the sake of building rapport. Like Day 3, days begin flying by. On Day 9, Delilah informs Henry that the teens have gone missing. She asks Henry whether she should report their experiences. Regardless of what you say here, she will not follow a report. She wants to avoid having to talk to the police, and so just lies and says that the two of you have not seen any sign of them. Though she doesn't tell you this until significantly later. On night 15, Henry is awoken in the middle of the night by his radio calling. Drowsy and half asleep, he answers. What do you want? It's Julia. Obviously Henry is dreaming here, but it's only a half dream. He is actually the one that starts the call, waking Delilah up. What he dreams is the conversation. On day 33, on his way to collect his tower's monthly supplies, Delilah mentions it again. Here, Henry can open up to her a little bit. If he does, she will recount her breakup with her own ex-boyfriend, Javier, who left her after she selfishly chose to stay on vacation, then to return to him when his brother died. And then, on night 64, a major fire breaks out. You've got a front row seat for what might be the biggest fire of the year. Yeah, it's really going. I'm gonna call it in. The Shoshone National Forest is a real place. If you're American, you might be wondering why I need to clarify that, but the reality is that the Shoshone National Forest is forever living in the shadow of its more popular westwardly sister, Yellowstone. Interestingly enough, the Shoshone was the first incorporated national forest, so it's even older than Yellowstone. Two forks is nowhere to be found, but the Torrefair region, Delilah's region and Firewatch, is a real location. I don't believe that there's an equivalent for Jonesy Lake, but Wapiti Station, an area later on in the game, has a region associated with it. And there's even a Wapiti Ranger Station in the real national forest as well. Then there's a Beartooth Mountain to match Beartooth Point. The Forest Service really used to pay people to spend summers, maybe a few months, in fire towers. The towers even look remarkably similar to what we see in the game. A lot of this work these days is automated and remote from what I can gather, but fire lookouts are still hired every summer. Up here in Canada, the Alberta Wildfire Service seems to still be continuing this practice on a large scale, with 127 towers. A job post Thing for this past summer is still up, and it lists bathing slash shower facilities as usually the result of individual ingenuity. In 1937, lightning started a fire in the Shoshone National Forest, eventually becoming a 1,700-acre firestorm. The firefighting teams were not prepared and did not have enough experience with wildfires. The main suppression force was the Civilian Conservation Corps, a New Deal labor relief program of young, mostly untrained men. The influence of the weather on wildfire spread was poorly understood, and radio communication was very poor or non-existent. This combination of circumstances led to the death of 15 firefighters making the Blackwater Wildfire one of the deadliest in the United States. This fire laid the groundwork for professional wildfire suppression teams like the Smoke Jumpers, elite firefighters skydiving into fire zones. These professional teams settled wildfire response, extinguish immediately. But as the ecological role of the fire became more studied, and teams got very good at putting out fires, causing a buildup of dry underbush that would intensify every subsequent fire, it became clear that these had to be allowed to burn. Then, in 1988, some 50-odd controlled fires emerged and burned down nearly a million acres of Yellowstone. The issue suddenly became political, as the public was in fear of losing a national monument and could not always accept the idea of controlled burning. Fire response became fractured and somewhat conflicted, with different interests and powers working against each other. Whatever name Henry and Delilah decide to give to the fire, it doesn't seem to be real. At least, I can't find any evidence that a wildfire of similar magnitude, it's said to be around 20 
20,000 acres in the area in 1989 actually happened, so it's likely that it's a plot point created by the writers. However, the political situation around wildfire management is very real. The response to the fire is at first very aggressive. Fire planes fly by every few minutes and an elite unit is sent in immediately. This turns into a fire crew that attempts to stop the fire at the river with control burns until everyone is evacuated at the end of the game as the firefighters are pushed back. Delilah seems to think that letting fires burn is an absurd idea and mentions this multiple times. She's probably wrong, considering the research that has been done on the topic, but she's an average person in 1989 and her sentiment was wildly shared at the time. The fire serves another purpose here. Delilah gets a bottle of tequila as you both stare at the blaze and their conversation begins to reveal the extent of their relationship. You can choose to return these feelings or softly reject them, but either way Henry and Delilah become more tangled in this increasingly complicated narrative. And then on day 76, Henry goes fishing. Fish, and I'm sick of all the stuff I got to eat. Well, I won't tell anyone you're a poacher. Someone left their clipboard out here. Huh. It could have been one of the fishing game folks. See if there's a name or a credential or something. I can call it in. What? The, uh, it's. Holy shit. What's going on? You didn't actually find a bear, did you? Someone has written down what we said to each other, have been saying. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, I don't talk to the other lookouts as much as I talk to you, not in the same way. No way. Wait, hold on. Something's out here. Henry? I'm worried. I found a walkie-talkie out here, too. Uh, okay. It's going shithouse. Well, get it if you have not an... <laughs> So that's what all the weird foreshadowing was about. Are you there? Henry gains consciousness quickly and reports to Delilah. He mentions the name Wapiti Station, which he says he saw on the clipboard, and Delilah remembers a region called Wapiti Meadow in Henry's sector. Hiking to that region on the map leads Henry to a valley surrounded by a large chain-length fence. Delilah suggests that he hike down to the firefighters camp to ask for help in breaking down the gate, so Henry sets off towards it, finding some stripped snowmobiles on the way and passing an abandoned scout camp. He finds that the firefighters have left, but also picks up a forgotten Pulaski. The axe now allows you to clear up overgrown pants and smash the gate down. But before you go, you find some kind of memo, presumably for the firefighters. It suggests that they were being moved to protect their research camp at Wapiti Station. Alright, that's confirmation. Some kind of research is happening in Wapiti Meadow that neither of you know about. There's clearly something going on here that can't be brushed off. Great. Now we beeline it for the gate. And now we find out there's a research site out here that we don't know about? What are they researching? Oh, you know, probably just horned toads. Just on my way back, in and out of trees in the middle of nowhere. Do you see anybody? No, definitely not. All right, so uh, tell me what you think of this. <coughs> Did you just cough? No. Did you just cough? No. Oh, oh fuck. fuck. Um... There isn't any way someone, like, another lookout could be on this line, is there? No. Not without tapping our radios. Wait a second. That's not how radios work. The next day starts with an exasperated Henry trying to contact Delilah, who finally picks up and acts as though nothing was wrong. She uses the poster on Henry's wall to give him a place to go without actually naming it on the radio. Trekking out there, Henry finds a second radio in a cash box and gets connected to Delilah, who tells him that she snuck it in into a sector. Now confident that they're alone on the line, Henry runs to the fence and breaks down the gate with his axe. Heading in, Henry finds all kinds of expensive and unknown communications equipment, stuff that Henry doesn't recognize. Inside their tent, he finds weeks of supplies, bets for three, more and more unknown devices. In a box blinking red, Henry finds some kind of transceiver. Turning it on leads him back to the main desk. Under a pile of papers lays a tracker, and then case files, one for each of them laying out their lives, titled Subjects. What is it? There's a folder of reports here. What do they say? They're assessments about the two of us. There's stuff in here about Julia. 
Like what? Stuff I didn't tell you. This is... What, what does it say about me? You said there was one about me. And it looks like they've been following me around. What I do when I'm out hiking? Jesus! Henry, do you hear me? I'm so sick of letting these people do this to us. We should just burn the place down. Think about it. Look, maybe that's what they want us to do. What do you mean? Maybe they're trying to push us to the point where we do something crazy. The grass is dry as hell here. It would go up in a second. Well, now I'm thinking, what if you're right? I, I just don't think we should do anything that we can't undo. Well, maybe it's not the best idea. Yeah, it's definitely not the best idea. Oh, I'm so fucking wound up! It's alright. I'm just gonna hike back. As Henry leaves the meadow, he turns back to see it in flames. What the hell happened to you? It's definitely not the best idea. It wasn't me. <sighs> what do we do? We just call it in like any other fire. And what about who started it? What about them? Uh, the person who started it? Yeah. We're talking about people watching us out here who are now burning the forest and everything in it around us. I, I, I don't know what to do about that. Except get the hell out. Yes, get us the hell out of here. I will. Back at the tower, the yeah, transceiver picks up another signal. Henry decides to follow it immediately, leading him to just outside his tower, where a backpack lies tied up to an alarm. Attached to it, he finds a key, K-452. Delilah calls to tell him that there's someone in his tower. Henry runs back to find that a cassette player was left taped to his door. Left a cassette player taped to my damn door. Uh, I don't even know what to say to that. Well, let's see what's on it. The next morning, someone pretending to be Henry calls around to the lookouts and says that they knew the cause of the Wapiti fire. Delilah points out that Henry's isn't likely to be the only copy of the tape. Wanting some answers, Henry finally heads down towards cave 452 with his newfound key. Once inside, he suddenly finds himself trapped as someone closes the door behind him. Slowly, Henry manages to crawl to the other side and breaks into a small clearing. Then, as he tries to leave, he finds a crudely built castle. found an outcropping that someone was using as a little fort. I think it was Brian Goodwin. Really? Yeah, he built himself a real castle. Brian was not exactly a popular kid. He was a scrawny, creative, and polite young boy living with a strict single dad. Even more so than today, the culture in general in 1989 wasn't exactly tuned towards his type, and he frequently escaped into his fantasy world. He would construct vast and exciting worlds to gross himself in to escape the boredom and mundanity of his everyday life. When his dad dragged him out to the middle of nowhere, now away from the restrictions of his social and school life, Brian would come out here and put his visions to life. Stone by stone, he built himself a literal castle amidst the mountains and filled it with everything that he loved. He would no doubt spend hours and hours here every day, meticulously decorating the walls and drawing elaborate plans to retrieve his backpack. He was yet another victim of the escapism offered by the forest. Except, unlike the others, he seemed to really like it here. Instead of being burdened by his past and feeling like he was just running, Brian built something for himself here. He took his fantasies and turned them into a reality. Under the piles of items left behind by Brian, Henry finds a set of climbing anchors. A note attached to them tells the finder to send them to an address in Nebraska. He had hidden them from his dad to avoid having to go through his climbing exercises. Henry picks these up and uses them to leave the clearing. Armed with these anchors, Henry heads back into the cave. Brian died while climbing, ironically on one of Ned's climbing exercises. He fell. 
It's never made clear exactly how this happened. Delilah, having never liked Ned, seems to believe that Ned pushed him or otherwise killed him himself. I... I don't know. I think Brian just fell. Maybe a victim of the rock slide that we see in the game. Hey, D. There you are. I've been worrying my ass off. You need to call search and rescue. Um, what? There's a body in the cave. It's Brian Goodwin. <sighs> Gotta be fucking kidding me. How does that... <sighs> what? I don't... <sighs> How? Climbing, I think, or made to look like a climbing accident. I, I think that's just what it was. He was probably exploring the cave and, and maybe his rope gave out. But whoever locked me in there probably didn't even know about him. I'm sorry, Delilah. I'm so sorry. By this point, the original fire has merged with the Wapiti Station fire, effectively erasing all possible evidence of arson. Now wildly out of control, it threatens Two Forks and Thoroughfare, leading to an evacuation order. The next day, as Henry packs up his belongings to leave, the transceiver goes off again. Though both Delilah and Henry are somewhat discouraged, Henry decides to follow the signal anyway. As he walks, Delilah tells him that the missing teens have been found, apparently getting lost in a neighboring state. Henry follows the signal to a cliffside, where he finds his name scrawled on the rock, urging him to climb. Henry quickly realizes that he has found some kind of improvised home built into the cliff. The area is full of stolen and handmade supplies, with dismantled and destroyed electronics littering every surface. Among the clutter, one can find records of Henry and Delilah's conversations logged. The subject files found at the Wapiti Station can be found here, but these have mistakes, followed by frustrated swearing. Ned's hideout, where he hid for three years after his son died. He claims, on the cassette left for Henry, that he didn't kill him. Climbing accident, he says. Brian didn't like climbing, didn't do it properly, didn't sink his anchor in the right way. A simple accident, he says. Ned wouldn't be the kind of person to go back after that. The police, a funeral, he wouldn't see the point in it. A jaded war veteran trying to escape society would find himself at the center of it if he went back. Not held back by anything, he just decided to stay in the forest, stealing batteries and supplies to survive. Eventually, the presence of Henry in the area freaks him out when he first meets him coming out of the cave that his son died in. So he tries to drive Henry out by staging a conspiracy-style grand experiment and have Henry periodically discover it. He destroys the teen's camp to drive them away and frames it on Henry. It's possible that he was the one who sabotaged the cable. He threatens Henry by breaking into his home. When Henry discovers the clipboard, he sets up a fake experiment in Wapiti Station, a simple research site having nothing to do with the lookouts, to cover up his mistakes. Then, as the fire threatens his hideout anyway, he leads Henry to the cave to try to trap him as he enters it. When Henry escapes and manages to finally find Brian's body, Nat gives up and leads him to his hideout before running to find somewhere else to hide. Henry's final hike towards Delilah's tower to be airlifted is somber and introspective for both of them. Delilah blames herself, reasoning that if she had followed the rules and told the Forest Service about Brian's presence, he would be sent home in the first place. She's probably right, but I don't think she did anything wrong, at least not morally speaking. She spoke to Brian a lot, and so knew that he was much happier living out his fantasies in the forest than he would be in Nebraska. She could hardly be blamed for not expecting him to fall from a cliffside and die. Of course, nothing you say can really counsel her here. You hear the helicopter arriving for the first time, and hear Delilah speaking with the operator. You can tell her to go ahead and leave with it, or you can ask her to wait for you first. She will agree with either choice, but it doesn't matter. Once you reach the edge of the sector and take the cable car to Delilah's, she's gone. You put on her radio headset and talk to her one last time. She says that she couldn't bear to stay in the forest any longer. I wonder if she just couldn't bring herself to meet Henry. She tells Henry to visit Julia. She implores him to face his problems. You climb down from the tower and approach the helicopter. Just like that, you're whisked away from the forest.
This game receives a lot of criticism, primarily aimed at that ending, how Henry can never meet Delilah regardless of what happens. But those that dig a little deeper have a lot to say about how various aspects of the story just don't make sense. And really, they're completely right. Let's go back to day 76, where Henry finds the clipboard at the lake and then gets knocked unconscious by Someone Ned. First of all, here. what's happening here is a little insane, right? Henry and Delilah are stuck out in the middle of nowhere at a time when there's no reliable way to contact the outside world with some kind of stalker after them, listening in on their conversations. Would you still be joking around and chipper like they are? No way, especially Henry. Maybe there's an argument to be made here that this still hasn't really sunk in for Delilah, considering that she's just taking Henry's word for it, but that changes soon enough. Her reasoning for not contacting the Forest Service is that she likes this job, and felt that if there was ever any doubt that she was perfectly sane, she would be let go. But there's a point at which some job you like becomes less important than making sure your new pseudo-boyfriend isn't killed in the woods all by himself. This divergence I'm talking about continues on until nearly the end of the game. Henry and Delilah are way too chipper, too calm, and continue cracking jokes unless they're right in the middle of a tense story moment. At first, I thought that contact with the outside world was cut off entirely for the two, since the wire was cut. Delilah even mentions trying to get some lazy technician out on the field to repair it, and so I figured that this was a clever plot point. It would be a coincidence that teens cutting off communication just before the lookouts need it. Or hey, maybe it was Ned who cut the wire and framed the teens. But no! Delilah says that the reason she won't contact the police or the Forest Service is because she doesn't want to lose her job, not because she can't. That's a pretty bad excuse. First of all, there is a paper trail of weird things happening. Henry's Tower, Forest Service property, was vandalized way before any of this started, and this is something that Delilah explicitly mentions that she reported. Then, for the love of God, there are two teens missing here. I understand, even though Henry doesn't know it yet, that she never actually reported meeting them, but when there's something truly dangerous out there, shouldn't she forget her own job and make sure that the girls are safe by reporting the events in the forest? The game also really tries to spice up the mystery aspect quite a bit. Was it really necessary for Ned's purposes to throw Henry's typewriter out the window? Why did he so carelessly show himself to Henry before he even knew anything had happened? If he was the one who cut the cables, why? Henry didn't suspect anything yet, and doing so just led him to discover what Ned did to the teens camp. If it was the teens who did the cutting, why would Ned leave their campfire lit to warn Henry? He used to be a fire watch, surely he would know that campfires would have a distinct smoke profile. Hell, for that matter, surely there's no way that Ned just forgot his clipboard on this rock. Why would he feel the need to record this kind of information about Henry and Delilah's conversations? Then, if he was just standing here behind this rock ready to punch Henry, why didn't he just pick up the clipboard so Henry doesn't find it? Let's say it was intentional then. Why in the world would Ned purposefully make Henry and Delilah think that something was happening if he just didn't want them to find out about Brian? I told this story as I interpreted it on my first playthrough, with Ned creating this elaborate conspiracy at Wapiti Station to cover up the fact that he was monitoring their conversations, but in reality, Henry finds out about Wapiti Meadow by seeing Wapiti Station written on the clipboard, so sending him there must have been intentional. Again, I have to ask, why? What's the point of all of this? Maybe it was to get the incriminating audio clip of the two threatening to burn the place down, but then why not actually use it to get them arrested, instead of pretending to be Henry and vaguely suggesting that he knew who started the Wapiti Station fire? Also, surely, he didn't expect them to immediately give him the lines necessary to make it seem like they burned down the station. Why the hell did he give Henry the key to the cave? Maybe so he could try to kill him by closing the gate behind him? But why? It isn't as though he was going to find the body without the key in the first place. Maybe then, Ned was realizing that he would have to leave anyway because of the oncoming fire, so he wanted someone to discover his son's body and alert search and rescue. Why close the gate on him then? If Ned leaves before Henry gets to his hideout, why did he leave all his stuff here? Maybe the tech gadgets were too hard to carry, but his clothes? His books? Cards from his dead son? Why are there so many pointless red herrings? What's the deal with this call Delilah takes at the beginning of the game that's left totally unexplained? Why did the teens disappear if it had nothing to do with Ned? It's just a cheap ploy to raise the stakes. Then, these devices at Wapiti Station are clearly industrial scientific equipment. At first I thought that Ned set this all up, and the gutted snowmobiles were the materials that he used, so two engines somehow turn into all of this? Into radio equipment? I guess the game thinks that this is just a normal research station for biologists or something? 
mine. There's actually a soil grid out here, which makes sense, because soil grids are a technique we use in field surveying, estimating populations in an area. But then, of the three people at the station, none of them found all these documents Ned put in their tent. Maybe they had already left by that time, and left behind all their equipment and personal belongings. Really? Look, I can just keep going, and it would be entirely fair for me to do so. It's entirely reasonable to expect a coherent story that properly ties everything up and is mostly seamless in a game where the story is the core of what you're purchasing. Actually, there are some players out there who suggest that the story is closer to that than what we might expect. You see, some players think that Delilah is lying to Henry the whole time. According to this theory, Delilah and Ned are in on it from the beginning. It's why you can see Delilah's tower from Wapiti Station, even though the game suggests that it was built into a valley to hide it. It's why Delilah pretends to not know how radios work. Ned is who is hand delivering Delilah. Lila supplies. It's why his notes on Henry suddenly change in tone after they have an intimate conversation and the fire starts out. Most importantly, it would explain that first call that was never explained. There are more parts to this theory, each positing potential explanation for the aforementioned plot holes and story inconsistencies, but I won't go into them here, since I think that this theory is actually wrong. As far as I can tell, every single aspect of this theory really mirrors the actual story in that they are just single sentence hypotheticals. They can't neatly tie up the whole story. Delilah's tower in the background is part of the skybox. It's not really meant to be seen from the valley. The year is 1989. Maybe Delilah really doesn't know how exactly radios work. After all, this is the peak of the Cold War, when spy movies and the like were super popular. There's even a book series in the game that seems to be a James Bond analog. The supplies have to arrive somewhere in the Shoshone. Since Thoroughfare Tower has a landing site, maybe the Forest Service drops them there and leaves the other towers to pick up their own packages. Ned's opinion could have just changed after getting to know Henry a bit, especially when he talks about how he left his wife behind. The unexplained call seems to always be the smoking gun for this theory, but, well, it's just such a non-issue. We know that this game has no problem making up red herring plot points just for the sake of it, the prime example being the teens disappearing. So why not this as well? Overall, I think that this theory is quite weak, but but more importantly, while I understand the player's need to try to explain the inconsistencies present in this game, I wonder if this kind of thinking is actually over-analysis. Everything in this game is thematically and mechanically tied to the idea of escapism. Henry comes to the Shoshone to run from his problems. His life has been shattered because the love of his life doesn't recognize him anymore, and his friends think that he's a bastard for abandoning her, and his dog died. Instead of trying to move on, instead of trying to find new meaning, to reconcile with the past and incorporate it healthily into his future, he runs off to the middle of the forest. When Delilah's boyfriend left her, a guy that she wanted to marry, because of what was mostly her own fault, instead of trying to solve these internal issues, instead of trying to move on and build a new future, she runs off to the forest and becomes addicted to the lack of responsibility coming back year after year. When Ned, grumpy VAR veteran, returns to society, he finds that he has a son that he doesn't relate to and a society that he has no place in. He runs off to the forest. When Brian, a nerdy kid who doesn't really fit into his own culture, gets a chance to leave it, he literally builds himself a monument to his fantasies and escapes into his own imagination. Maybe then, you are here as an escape. To look at some beautiful vistas and hike through nature for a few hours. To explore a campy James Bond style story while actually learning about these new tragic characters. While you take a break from the life that you have. And do you really need a conspiracy-esque story for that? Do you need a multi-layered, systematically explained, mind-controlled conspiracy theory? Or do you need a low-stakes, fun and whimsical sort of adventure to take your mind off of things? Firewatch is a convergence of you and Henry. So when the helicopter arrives and the game is over, you and Henry are in the same spot, with a new shared experience, but ready to diverge again, back into the life that you have.